The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYML LP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters. Greetings and welcome to the Personal Safety Show. This is Marcus Melnick from Firearm Mentor and Stress to Logic, your host. And today we have Dr. David Yamani from Wake Forest University with a very interesting interest and we're going to jump right into it. David, thank you very much for joining us on the on the radio program. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Awesome. Can you tell our listeners about your origin story, your background, your education, and where you, how you got to where you are today? To start, where I am today is I'm a dozen years into a personal and professional journey into American gun culture. Where I started was outside of San Francisco in the Bay Area of California, uh, totally outside of gun culture. And this sort of blue bubble that insulated me from the reality of guns kind of followed me through my education, which was a, a bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of California at Berkeley, and then a graduate degree in sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, both fairly liberal places. And then my first job was at the University of Notre Dame teaching sociology in Indiana. And even, you know, in Wisconsin and Indiana, although there are many more gun owners there than there were in the Bay Area, I still, given the nature of the people that I primarily associated with, didn't really know much about the reality of guns. And it wasn't until I moved to North Carolina in 2005 to take a job at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem that I started to see signs of guns and gun culture out in the world, like, you know, billboards for gun stores or signs for a concealed carry class or a gun show at the local uh, armory and those kinds of things. And so that really opened my eyes to this world that I really didn't know anything about. Uh, And I was at a point in my professional career where I was looking to move on from the sociology of religion. And I thought, you know, what better place to start exploring other than something that I didn't really know anything about, but I found fairly intriguing, which was guns. And that was in around 2011. I shot a gun for the first time as a 42 year old and I've been exploring ever since. Fantastic. This is me being curious. What brought you to the Midwest? Really just uh, graduate school, pretty much at the, at the level of uh, doctoral work and getting a faculty job, which was my goal back from when I was a sophomore in college. You know, you really have to look on a national scale because there are as many faculty jobs out there as there are people who want them. So Wisconsin has uh, one of the best sociology programs in the country, and then I happened to get lucky and get this job at Notre Dame, which was a a very good job. And so, you know, I've kind of been on the move. Every time I move, I move a little bit further away from my family homestead in California. And so I think that uh, my family starts to wonder if I'm doing it on purpose, but it's really, you know, completely revolving around what I could do to, to get a good education and to get a good job. Awesome. So you're at Wake, Wake Forest. W-A-K-E. I'm in the Chicago area. There is also a Lake Forest College. It's college, not university. So I just want to clarify that. It's not Lake Forest on Lake Michigan. It's Wake Forest in the Carolinas. How did you end up there? Just Was there an opening and you put in for it? Or how? What, what's the story behind that? There were things I really liked about Notre Dame. There were some things that I didn't really like about it. And so uh, faculty members, you know, who are on the tenure track about in your sixth year, you're considered for whether to, they'll give you tenure and promotion or not. And I felt I had a fairly strong case given my track record and some of my colleagues weren't as convinced. And so I thought I might uh, look to jump before I was pushed, and a job happened to open up at Wake Forest. Uh, I had a friend who was teaching in the department. She let me know that they were hiring and hiring in my area, which was amazing, and applied for the job and was fortunate enough to get the job. And it was really about some differences between Wake Forest as a university and Notre Dame as a university that made the difference and got me looking. Uh, and I've been you know, very happily on the faculty here at Wake Forest since 2005 now, so almost 20 years now. 
So one of the things I saw in your background, which is really intriguing to me, and I'll explain why before I ask you the question. I am of the Jewish faith, grew up in a Jewish area, went to Loyola University, Catholic University, had to find classes in religion. So I found a class called the Old Testament, and I was like, perfect. I walk in and it's taught by a Jesuit. You want to talk about confusing? No, that's me being funny. I, it was a fantastic experience. But one of the things in your background is your studies of sociology of religion. Can you touch on that and tell us what that all means and how you generated that interest? Your story reminds me that Wake Forest had a department of religion for a long time and still does. But because students were often often thought they would take courses there and learn about religion per se, uh, they actually recently changed the name to the Department for the Study of Religion to kind of clarify that they're not teaching religion, but right. that they're teaching about religion. And I think that's similar to the sociological approach, which is you know, that we want to understand you know, how religion works in society. Uh, there are certainly some people who get into the field because they're working out their awkward childhood relationship with religion. For me, and this is, there's an odd parallel to my experience getting into and studying guns, which is that for, you know, in addition to growing up outside of gun culture, I really grew up in a fairly secular environment in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so I wasn't really exposed to, I wouldn't say religion so much as people of faith. I wasn't really exposed to people of faith until I got to college. And so, again, opened up this whole world to me that I wasn't familiar with. And you know, I talk about this a little bit in the preface to this book that I have coming out on guns, which is that the basic principle of sociology is things are not what they seem. And so you have to have this curiosity about the world and how the world is to want to push beyond the surface level of appearance. So, you know, this, I think the attraction of religion was this thing that was kind of somewhat foreign to me, but then I got to know better and moved into the inside and tried to understand it in a more complex way in the same way with, you know, guns, which I spent most of my life not caring about or not understanding and then had this fascination that I needed to push and push and try to understand more and more. I think that my really graduate studies really solidified my interest in the sociology of religion. And for the first 20 years of my career, that's, that's the work I did. Fascinating. Can you talk about the six books and scholarly articles that you've written that are already published? Yeah, these are you know largely in the sociology of religion. Oddly, the the first book I wrote was actually about multiculturalism in higher education. That was an outgrowth of my undergraduate thesis at Berkeley. So it stands out a little bit from the other work. I had thought I was going to do more sociology of education than sociology of religion. But after that, you know, I got into the study of religion. I did my dissertation was on religious lobbying in the Wisconsin legislature. I made that into a national study of Catholic bishops lobbying at the state level, did a book on that, got in, interested in the process of initiation in the Catholic church. This really revolved around the fact that I was fortunate to be at Notre Dame and it was easy to study the Catholic church at Notre Dame. So did a couple of books on that and a couple of books that are sort of contributions to the sociology of religion. One is a sort of handbook overview of the field, and one is a textbook on the sociology of religion that I'm actually in the process of revising right now for the eighth edition. It's called Religion and Sociological Perspectives. So uh, I still do have a little bit of a, a hand in the sociology of religion field, although most of my other work, the articles that I've been doing recently, have touched on various aspects of American gun culture. So I want to tell the listeners why I, I asked the series of questions about religion. And there's a pattern I see here with David. And the pattern is just the epitome of being open-minded, saying there's something I don't understand or something I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with. I'm going to go study it instead of saying, 
oh, you know, people who do that, people, religious people are nuts or gun people are nuts. It's no, let's, let's have a well-rounded understanding of it. So I'm trying to demonstrate that pattern in that if you don't know something, maybe someone should start to research it and find out about it because it's hard to either like or dislike something you haven't tried. For example, uh, my family vacations in South Haven, Michigan, and they have an ice cream flavor called Blue Moon, and it's the worst ice cream flavor I've ever had. But as a kid, I loved it. But you don't know until you try it. It's this blue ice cream turns your face blue, and I don't, I can't even describe the flavor other than nasty. But the point is, you have to try things before you can have a, a really unbiased judgment about them. So, can you talk about what is light over heat? Yeah, light, I think, well, light over heat sort of reflects some of uh, what you're saying there, having to do with this curiosity about how the world works and the goal, especially religion is such a fraught issue in the United States, guns as much of a fraught issue. And so I see just a lot of people getting angry you know, in, in all directions. And that's the heat that I'm trying to avoid, right? There's so much heat around this issue that I kind of want to approach it in a way that, that tries to bring more light or enlightenment or, you know, to shed a light on the issue, not to tell people what they should think, but to offer people a point of view that might inform the way they think about the issue in a, in a more, say, calm way, a more rational way, a more insightful way. Uh, and that's, that's a kind of goal for all of my work. Currently, I'm working on guns, but what, whatever I work on next, that'll still be my orientation. You know, really wanting to, to bring the light of understanding over the heat of argument. In 2011, you became a nationally recognized scholarly authority on firearms. How did that happen? How did you become this authority? Was it through articles, research, publications? In 2011, I started studying guns. I probably became an authority five years after that, because I had to figure out what on earth I was doing. You know, when I got into the sociology of guns, I didn't know anything about guns or the sociology of guns. And so I was in the shallow end of the pool and drowning, but I worked hard to get up to speed. I read everything I could that was written by scholars. I immersed myself in the culture by going in, as you said, with this open mind, with this genuine curiosity about guns and gun owners and gun culture. I started to kind of both gain an understanding and also a, a particular perspective. The dominant scholarly approach to guns looks at the negative side of it, criminology, epidemiology, public health, accidents, injury, crime. And my experience of guns and gun owners and gun culture really suggested that, yeah, that that's an aspect of the reality, but that's not the whole of the reality. And I don't even think that's the most important aspect of the reality. So I, you know, became one of the only sort of scholars who are studying guns today who approach it from what I call the perspective of the normality of guns and gun owners. That's kind of the niche I fill when the media or panels are being constituted. They need someone to speak about gun culture in and of itself, I'm one of the few people that they can call to speak to that. That actually segues into my next question. Can you talk about your blog, which is gunculture2.0.com? Very early on, as I said, I got into the study of guns before I knew anything about guns. And so as part, just part of my work as a scholar, I'm constantly writing. You know, you're thinking, you're writing, you're thinking, you're writing. But I didn't have any colleagues and I didn't have any audience to write to. And so I started a blog, it's in, you know, 2011 might've been on the tail end of uh, the social significance of blogging. You know, I just start writing what I was thinking about, what I was observing. And I think in the first year I had maybe 600 people visit the site, but as I learned more, as I wrote more, as I became better known, in the field, more and more people started visiting the site. So it's it's really a repository of this journey that I've taken inside gun culture over the past 12 years. I often find myself going back to 
earlier blog posts that I've written because they really capture where I was at that moment in time. And oftentimes nothing has changed from, you know, I could repost things that I wrote in 2014 that might be equally applicable today. Blogs are not followed as much as they used to be, but I persist in in writing to my blog because even if only a few people read it, I feel like I'm reaching an audience that I can't reach through my regular scholarly work. This is the part of our conversation that I am absolutely excited, thrilled, and tickled about. Can you talk about your course at Wake Forest called Sociology of Guns? In 2015, I'd been working in the field for long enough that I felt like I could teach a semester-long course on the field of study. And so I began teaching the sociology of guns. And again, I tried to embody this general perspective that I have, which is to understand guns and gun owners and gun culture on its own terms and not just as this something that creates mayhem and death in in society, although I do cover homicide, suicide, accidental injuries, other negative outcomes. But the course is is centered more on, on the normality of guns, the history, the legal frameworks, why people own guns, and so on. But I think probably the, the aspect of the course that gets the most attention and the most questions and comments is, uh, and I've done this from the first time I taught the course, uh, the, the very first meeting that we have as a class is at a gun range. And the students are given the opportunity to shoot a 22 pistol, a 9 millimeter pistol, and an AR platform rifle. Uh, And no one's required to do this, but they're given the opportunity. And in recent years, almost all of the students, most of whom don't have much uh, experience with guns, have taken the opportunity to fire all three guns. And that's not meant to convert people to gun ownerships or to be becoming gun rights activists, but it's just to give them an experiential understanding of what firearms are, how they work, and why people might be interested in them. And so, you know, that's a real kind of distinctive feature and a highlight of the class. It really kind of creates a certain ethos within the class that allows us to talk about, even though students differ in their views and experiences with guns, they all have this common experience of having experienced firing these guns uh, that are, you know, very commonly owned and used in America. So what, no revolver? I'm, and I'm teasing you. I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> You know, I've, I've, I have a uh, I have a single action twenty two revolver that I've thought of for to substitute for the the twenty two pistol because it you know it's a different mechanism. It's very safe for people to shoot. Uh, you know, so maybe someday I'll do that if I had enough time. Problems is time is an issue, but you know, I'd love to have them try you know a revolver and also a shotgun. It's kind of funny. I rarely recommend except for this morning a concealed carry pistol that's single action but there i just have one customer who who needs to do that i don't usually take a single action revolver to my classes because it takes so long to load and unload and it's it's very slow so i don't i don't recommend doing it in a group setting unless someone has a specific (laughs) request but it's just me teasing you a little bit yeah no, no, I, I bought that gun specifically because I had kids uh, at the time that I wanted to take to the range, and you know, I, I thought you know, this is probably the e- one of the easiest to shoot and safest guns for them right. to try shooting with. Coming soon, there is going to be an online seminar similar to the Sociology of Guns course, although since it's online, it's national, and we're not all going to fly to some range somewhere so that part's out but can you talk about the online course what it's going to encompass and how people can find out more information and enroll i'm going to enroll in it when it's available because i am thrilled so can you just start talking about the online version of the course over the years because i I do blog and talk a lot about my sociology of guns course over over the years people have said oh i would really love to take that course is there any way I can audit that course. And because it's offered at this private university, there's, it's not really possible for people who are outside the university to take that course. And so I've thought 
you know, how could I make this more available? Thought of creating almost you know, like a parallel version of the course that people could pay for and take. But then, you know, I really thought I needed to become a little bit more simple and not think about doing, you know, basically the same thing I'm doing here, but doing something that would be more accessible to a lot of people. So it's going to be in a webinar format. We'll meet for seven weeks starting on March 25th. The, it's going to be on Mondays. And so the basic format will be, uh, I'll be presenting some material each week by lecture, and then I'll be taking questions from people who are in attendance or questions that people submit ahead of time uh, and trying to answer those questions. I'll also be you know, creating a syllabus and providing readings for people to do for each week. So it's, it's going to be a sort of reduced and less interactive version of what I do on campus. But I think it'll be a good overview of the way that I think about this field for you know, people who can't take the course in person here at Wake Forest and who want to have some kind of systematic overview of you know, how at least I approach the, the study of guns over a seven week period. So uh, it's the first time I've ever done it, like all things, you know, and I'm sure I'll learn a lot in the process of doing it, but if it goes well, I, it's something that I hope I can do on a regular basis. Uh, it'll it's set up so that if people can't attend the webinar live, they can they'll get a link. They can watch the recording at their leisure, and so I hope the technological infrastructure will work as I plan. But I'm I'm excited to to launch it on March 25th, and it'll run through May 6th. Do you have a time of day where you anticipate doing the webinar? The webinar is going to be on Mondays at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm planning for it to be an hour, but I've actually created the webinar to last longer than that in case, you know, we get carried away for some reason. But I know, you know, people's time is valuable, so I don't want to, you know, if I only have, you know, 20 minutes of lecture and 20 minutes of answering questions, that's what I'll do because I, I like to respect people's times and limits on their times. But if, you know, if we get carried away with question and answer, I want to make sure I, I satisfy what everybody puts into it. So it was tough to find a day and time that suited everybody. So I really had to kind of fit it around what worked with my schedule, but hopefully people who want to attend live, it will work at least some of the time. And again, if not, there's always the, the recording that they can watch after the fact. And certainly if people want to pose questions, they can do that. I'm also trying to think about ways I can create a, an offline place where people who are taking the class can interact with each other. Uh, so maybe off air, if you have some ideas about that, uh, I can, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts. I do have some ideas about that, and I'll share them after we're done with our conversation. Uh, that might be easy for you. In the online course, I'm going to put words in your mouth, and I apologize, but this is not a college credit course. Am I correct? That's right. There, There is no tuition. You will not get any college credits. There's no uh, CLE credits for it. It's really an entirely volunteer. It's kind of on the model. Uh, this the idea kind of came and went, but they used to have these MOOCs, massive open online courses, where university faculty would teach their courses and anybody in the world who wanted to sign up for the courses could sign up for them. So this is, this is the model that I'm imagining. Uh, although, you know, I, it's possible that it, it could grow to be something more than that. But uh, for the time being, you know, I didn't want to charge any tuition. I didn't want to get any credit. There's not any assignments that anybody has to do. There will be, I will be providing readings that form the basis for the each week's material. There's a syllabus. Uh, people, like I said, people are willing to, to are, are able to ask questions. But you know, it's not it's not a college class in a traditional sense. Very good. And the big question is, how can people enroll? Right now, I'm working up a homepage for the course with the syllabus on it. The best thing to do would be just to put a bookmark on davidyamani.com. And when you go there in a week or two, there will be a link to sign up or to register for the course and also a full syllabus describing what the course entails. 
I really want to make sure that I get the syllabus right, so I didn't want to rush it out. DavidEmonning.com will be the the landing page where people can access all the information they need to to register and to follow along. Great. And can you spell that for everyone? It's D A V I D, traditional spelling, and then followed by Y A M is in Mary, A N is in Nancy, E dot com. I want my listeners to know that this is my dream, teaching people about safety. If it weren't for you, if it weren't for my listeners, I couldn't live my dream. So on behalf of my family and myself, I want to thank each and every one of you for allowing me to live my dream. And I also want to continue to live my dream, and I'm excited to continue to spread the word of safety. Recently, I began a new service as a conference keynote speaker. So if anyone would like for me to speak at future events, or if anyone knows of an introduction or would like to discuss how we can work with one another, I'd love to do just that. The keynote speaking website is www.stress2logic.com. That is S-T-R-E-S-S, the number two, L-O-G-I-C, Dot com. If you're aware of any conference speaking engagements where you'd like to have me speak, I'd love an introduction. You can always share my electronic business card, which is Marcus Melnick, M-A-R-C-U-S-M-E-L-N-I-C-K dot com. Now, back to the show. When we return, we will be continuing the conversation with Dr. David Yamani, from Wake Forest University and continue to explore his online seminar regarding the sociology of guns. Stay tuned. The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYMLLP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters.